the Big Drip. Let's find out more about these historic events tonight on Project Algerine. It's June 23, 1910, and a man named Andrew Martin is suddenly awakened in the middle of the night while at his home on West 3rd Street, in Erie. Martin has become violently ill. To make matters worse, Martin has a fever of 105 degrees, making him slightly confused and disoriented. He gathers enough strength to make it into his living room, where he collapsed and tragically died. Just down the street, the very next day, 72-year-old Joan Ross collapsed on her front porch. When the police arrived to question the neighbors, they found another two bodies at a house right next door. The badly decomposed remains of William Butler were discovered a few days later at his home on West 4th Street. Reportedly, within the next six months, 135 people will have died, and another 1,064 citizens will have become sick. Authorities and medical professionals were brought in to determine the cause. It was determined that the citizens that had been getting sick had somehow all contracted typhoid. And the common connection between them all was that they all had drank polluted water. This confused the local authorities and the citizens of Erie who had just spent a considerable amount of money and resources upgrading their water system. To really understand what's going on, we need to start at the beginning. Our story begins way back in 1835, when a man named Hiram Brown moved to Erie from Northeast. Brown constructed a hotel located on the northeast corner of 6th and State Street. It's reported that located in the basement of Brown's Eagle Hotel was a freshwater spring. The spring water was protruding from a stone fish statue with the water pouring out of its mouth. It was said to be of the highest quality. If you could afford it. New businesses popped up almost immediately. Men would bottle up and deliver fresh water each day to several wealthy individuals in town. This process went on for a few years, and was working surprisingly well, at first. That is, until one fateful night in 1840, when Hiram Brown's Eagle Hotel burns down. The fire not only destroyed the hotel, it also destroyed the town's primary fresh water supply. The fact that the fire department's access to their water source was now itself on fire proposed another problem and another source of water was quickly sought out. 
Another fresh water spring was discovered on the Reed Farm, near 18th and French Street. However, the distance proposed a problem. Back then, almost all of the population lived below 12th Street. So, a series of underground channels, in which to lay a network of piping to carry the water, would need to be dug. Hollowed out wooden logs were used as rudimentary piping to bring the water down from 18th Street to where the population resided. Thankfully, some of these original water logs were discovered during a past renovation of the area and have been carefully preserved by the local historical society. Everyone was happy, but the water spring on the Reed Farm wasn't able to keep up with the demand by the ever-increasing immigrant population that was moving into Erie around that time. Erie needed a plan. That plan began to unfold on July 16, 1866, when drinking water, and more importantly, a fire suppression plan including 50 fire hydrants was put together. And they better hurry, because Erie's manufacturing sector is about to explode. At the time, there were no regulations for industry waste, so most of it ended up being dumped directly into the local creeks and streams. A decision they would eventually come to regret. The influx of new residential homes also added to the problem. Towards the end of its lifespan, the Erie Extension Canal contained so much raw sewage and waste, it was known locally as a stink pit. The city engaged Henry Birkenbein of Philadelphia to develop a water plan, who reported his findings on February 23, 1867. A formal contract to provide water for 20 years to 50 fire hydrants at $9,000 per year was offered, but for some unknown reason, it was never fulfilled. The authorities in Erie began searching for a location to construct their much-needed water station. A site was selected at the foot of Chestnut Street. The West Engine Company of Norristown was contracted in November of 1867 to provide two Cornish Bull engines. A single engine pumped 2.5 million US gallons per day. The Erie City Iron Works was contracted in December 1867 to erect a five-foot-wide standpipe which eventually reached a height of 233 feet, thought to have been the tallest standpipe in the world. John Kuhn was hired in 1868 to build the standpipe tower, and Captain James Dunlap was contracted that year to construct the crib work. The foundation for the waterworks was excavated beginning on the 7th of April 1868. A longer intake pipe was floated out into the bay, in the hopes the distance would bypass the pollution near shore. In 1871, the city purchased seven acres of land on the old Cochrane estate to construct a reservoir. With a price tag of around $106,000, these concrete reservoir walls are still holding back nearly 34 million gallons of water right now. The city contracted the Holly Manufacturing Company of Lockport, New York in 1885 to provide a Gaskell engine that could pump 5 million gallons of water per day. That engine was installed in a new pump house on June 11, 1887. In 
Erie now had a more stable water supply. But updates to the system will be required sooner than everyone thought. After many years of discharging waste into local tributaries, such as Mill Creek, Cascade Run, and the Extension Canal, fate finally caught up with Erie. The amount of sewage in the bay was so high, it made the water system act similar to having a drinking straw, connected directly to a public toilet. Illnesses were common, but this is something completely different. Salmonella typhi is a deadly bacteria that plagued early water systems around the country. This is the bacteria that causes typhoid. City officials responded quickly. A plan was drawn up, one that would extend the current intake pipe from the bay, under the peninsula, and out into Lake Erie, another 5,000 feet. The Water Commission acquired 175 acres of the peninsula from the state, and in 1904, awarded the contract to T.A. Gillespie of Pittsburgh to complete the extension. The plan also required two giant sediment settling basins to be constructed. The basins would allow silt to settle out of the lake water before it was pumped to the Chestnut Street facility. Each of these basins hold approximately 24 million gallons of water. The Chestnut Street bathing pool was opened to help improve public health and urban life. All these improvements helped slow the spread of typhoid, but, as we've learned by now, it was only temporary. In the year 1910, over 135 citizens of Erie died from typhoid. Another plan was quickly put into action. The Water Commission constructed a modern water treatment facility, just north of the pump house, located at the foot of Chestnut Street. Complete with its own testing facilities and laboratory. The water intake pipe was again extended. This time, the intake pipe would be extended three and a half miles out into Lake Erie. Known locally as Big Bertha, a 20 million gallon per day high-duty pumping engine was installed. Extending the intake pipe yet again and treating the water with hypochlorination seemed to have done the trick. After years of hard work and a lot of trying and failing, this process finally began to eliminate typhoid outbreaks in Erie. You've been watching The Big Drip on Project Algerine.